Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carl Sawatsky. On behalf of CTC Train Canada, I'd like to extend to everybody a very warm welcome to today's webinar entitled 10 Reasons to Develop a Mature Agile Business Analysis Competency. And so maybe some of you have noticed, but with the rise in Agile, it's been questioned, do we still really need business analysts? Well, today to help us with that question is Howard Padeswa. He's recognized internationally as a leader in the VA industry through his books, his appearances, his consulting work. And so obviously this question intrigued Howard, so he set out to find the answer. And well, I can give you the answer very quickly. And the answer is yes, in the world of Agile, BAs are more valuable than ever. However, what we'll discuss today is how Howard came to that conclusion, why he came to that conclusion, and why your organization should develop a mature Agile business analysis competency. So Howard, I'll pass the word along to you. We're very excited to learn what are these 10 reasons to develop a mature Agile business analysis competency. All right, well, thanks a lot, Carl. I hope everybody can hear me. So I'll, I'll sound good. Yep, right, we can hear you, thank, Howard. Yep. That's terrific, Carl, great to hear. Uh, I wanna thank uh, you for uh, inviting me to present the webinar and also for all the participants uh, who are probably taking away some valuable work time right now to do this. Um, I want to thank you as well. Uh, I wish I could see you all, and I'm going to try to envision <laughs> each and every one of you out there. Um, I, you know, it's hard for me to tell right now, but I'm guessing, uh, you know, some of you are probably uh, new to Agile Business Analysis right now. Uh, some of you might have been using a very simple uh, version of an analysis techniques within Agile, and maybe you're now um, suspecting that maybe you need to do a little bit more. And I'm guessing that some of you are probably uh, BAs out there who haven't transitioned yet and are just imagining, you know, if I need to do this on the horizon. And I guess the others, uh, you know, the other group that I haven't talked about yet, but I'm, I'm, you know, guessing also is out there are the people that started me out on this sort of, on this journey, I guess, um, altogether. And those are higher level executives that are making the decisions about those business analysts in their own organizations, particularly as their organizations are moving over into Agile and questions start to arise about, you know, that role. So, you know, Carl sort of, um, I guess, brought up that this uh, uh, this question, uh, you know, is something that has been concerning me. Uh, it has. Uh, you know, I've been in doing business analysis for quite a long time. Uh, this slide just shows a couple of books I've already put out there, and I'm doing another one on this very, very topic. And I wanted to kind of, I guess, start you off with, how did this all actually start for me? And, you know, when did I first actually need to answer this question? And, you know, the truth is that it's happened quite a few years ago when a um, European energy company, uh, by the way, I'm going to try to keep all of my clients' names as, as uh, I guess, anonymous as possible right now, but still try to give you realistic examples as we go through it. So it started off, we had this request from my company, and, you know, we provide VA services and so on. And they wanted to know, um, could we send somebody over to them uh, to make the business case for business analysis? So, you know, I've been at this for a while, and I was very used to those questions a long time ago, but to get these kind of questions now was a little bit odd for me because business analysis is pretty accepted now. Uh, when I found out why they're asking the questions, you know, it's that, that became, you know, another, another thing entirely. I found out that the reason they're asking this is because they were transitioning to Agile. So we sent somebody out uh, to them. They, uh, we began to do some consultancy to them, and you know things kind of kept along that way. And when re things really hit, I guess they uh, got into another gear uh, was when I personally was called in uh, to for a little chat with a senior executive at a, uh, I'll just say, a large communications company. And um, this is the question that brought everything to a head for me. He brought me and he said, Howard. I'm going to tell you, we've decided to transition the whole organization to Agile. Well, we've been working with this organization on VA practices. This, this was actually a new thing to hear from them. And then he told me that, you know, I got turning around, and they're telling me, you don't need VAs in Agile. Uh, you know, they're telling me there's no documentation. The developers just talk directly with the stakeholders, and they write the code. So he says to me, look, uh, i got a lot of VAs here, and tell me what I'm supposed to do with them. And am I going to need them? And if you're going to tell me that I do need them, I have another question for you, and that is, are they going to be using all the old techniques they used to use, like use cases, business rules, model analysis, you know, or are they going to have to start all over in, from scratch and learn new models? Well, I'll tell you, of course, uh, 
you know, I have to admit, I said yes right away. And, you know, I was a little bit interested, you know, uh, I don't know maybe there's a conflict of interest there. Um, you know, I, my company is involved in business analysis services. So naturally, we want to see that thing continue. But the only reason we're involved in that is because I actually believe in it. And I had been working with companies that have been done something similar, have been doing similar things up until then. They've been doing iterative incremental development. It wasn't full on agile, but it was some of the main aspects of agile. And they had those questions many, many years ago. In fact, I started getting questions like this in that context way back in the 1990s. Uh, and so my company has been working, have been working with those organizations for quite a while now, uh, doing, you know, applying the business analysis uh, role and function to those environments. And this just seemed like not a, not a huge leap from what we were doing before. And I felt that all the reasons that required BAs in the old days would still require them in the future once the company went full on with Agile. Uh, so that's what I said. I said yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, what have I found out years later? That's a journey that took me through uh, through one mainstream company after another as they began to ask me the same question and we started to deal with it. So I'm talking about insurance companies. I'm talking about telecom companies. Uh, I'm talking about companies that provide financial services. We've done work like this for the Can Canadian federal government and for the U.S. federal government. We've worked at the energy sectors. And, you know, I just want to get this clear out there, too. Many people think that Agile, you know, only applies to uh, startup type of organizations. And you can see from these that, you know, no, that's not the case. And they think that it's only, you know, very um, untraditional types of applications and products. And that's also not entirely true. We've done, we've, we've worked on Agile approaches to Agile incident management, which is something that you would at first think is at the opposite end of, you know, a, an Agile type of an application. Uh, auto insurance products, mortgage products, risk assessment services, uh, development of customer portals, uh, even a, a project to create create a system that allows you to request a project <laughs> and all the way up to the full life cycle management for that project. These are all things I've been involved in the past years. And I can tell you just the short answer too, that the uh, consultants who have been saying, no, you don't need your BAs anymore. Those people are reading their words today uh, as all these types of companies that I just talked about, um, from my own experience with them uh, have been using uh, BAs to improve the results that they get from Agile. I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what the figures show and then, you know, a good part of this talk is going to be about, you know, why that's actually the case, why they're getting those improvements. Now, you know, before I get into that, I just want to clear one thing up. <laughs> Many people have a different idea about what it means to be agile. So I just want to make sure that we're all in agreement about, you know, what I mean when I say agile. And I, I think really what the world means as well uh, when we're doing it properly. Uh, why bringing this all up? Because I've been to many organizations that say, hey, we're Agile. And when I look at it, when I look at what they're doing, what do I find out? I find out they're using the Agile tools, but that does not necessarily mean they're Agile. In fact, very often they're not Agile. It kind of boils down to, hey, we're using user stories. We've got Kanban boards. You know, we've got all the stuff. So we're Agile, right? Um, I would say not so fast. Being agile, you know, strictly speaking, means uh, only one thing. It means that you're following the agile manifesto and you're following the agile 12 principles. Now, I'm guessing that many of you out there has have probably um, seen this before. You wouldn't be here, but I just want to make sure everyone's seen it at least once. So here it is, folks. And I've just highlighted some of the aspects of the manifesto that are particular interest to BAs. Uh, there is a preference for what they call the items uh, on the left versus the items on the right. So there's a preference for if you're following a process that prefers working software instead of comprehensive documentation that is trying to foster a collaborative relationship with customers in, instead of a, a instead of a contractual relationship, uh, and where you've got a process that responds very well to change and guides success that way, as opposed to success means. I followed the plan. If that's what you're doing, uh, then you're basically, you know, you're following the agile philosophy. And so it's not about just the techniques you use, it's about the philosophy uh, with which you use those techniques. And there are, you know, agile 12 principles that, you know, come out of all of that. And again, I'm not going to go through them all, but just to make sure we're just all in a quick understanding, you've got to be delivering early and continuous delivery. So software is coming out. If, it's, if we're talking about a software project and 
we can talk about agile in the different contexts, but I think most of us are dealing with it in that case. In that context, it has to come out, the software has got to come out at a regular basis. Uh, you have to welcome changing requirements. So the idea of baselining requirements and freezing them and making them very hard to change, well, if you're doing that, well, you're not doing agile. Uh, we want uh, in Agile for business people and developers to be working closely together because it's felt that oral communication and close communication uh, is the best way to uh, prevent misunderstandings. And we're always looking in Agile for a very lean approach where anything that does not contribute directly to the final product is either eliminated or it's minimized. So that's what it means formally to be Agile. You follow the manifesto, you follow the principles. Um, how do you know if your organization is actually doing that? If you, if you can call yourselves agile, I'm going to give you the fast answer to that question. The fast answer is, if you are not pushing code out to you know uh, users or people who represent users about every two weeks, this is approximate, but about every two weeks, then if you're not doing that, you're not agile, and it doesn't matter what techniques you are using. This is a, we, you know, I made a sort of highlight of this on the previous slide, and the reason that I think you're here, I'll just flip you right back to that one, if I can. Uh, that's point um, Howard, Howard. Sure. Can you, can I, you sorry, Howard. If I, it's Carl here. Yeah, hi, Carl. If I can just interject uh, one minute. I heard someone uh, just input on the chat that they're not, for some reason, seeing the slides uh, moving, so I'm not sure if uh, that's what a lot of you are experiencing, just seeing the first uh, intro slide. You should um, be on the 12 principles slide. And right? the 12 principles, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm seeing that as a host, but maybe uh, you may have to go to the, see if you can see the tabs at the top for your presentation, where it says Howard uh, Pedesma. All right, so it says I'm sharing. Uh, yeah, okay, a so few others are seeing, okay. Uh, yeah, I think you're okay, because some people now are, some people are chiming in that they are seeing the 12 That's principles, so, so we're good to go. Yeah. To oh. There you go. My apologies for interrupting. Uh, continue. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to flip back and forth too much. And maybe yeah, no, that's okay. Seems all is working well. I confuse the software here. Yeah. I should have taken a more agile approach to WebEx. Um, all right, thanks. And let me know again, uh, Carl, if uh, you're getting you know issues like that coming up. So I find this is a kind of, kind of an easy way to boil things down. Uh, there are so many things about Agile that you can forget what the main point is. The main point is to get code out there in people's hands at a very frequent rate basis. I'm saying two weeks here because that's the norm in large mainstream organizations today. Uh, it's the norm for the Scrum uh, approach, which is the most popular approach we've seen out there with our clients in applying Agile. But it can be less. Um, I mean, there are organizations that do every one week, and that's that's the norm for extreme programming. And there are organizations um, that are so well tooled uh, that they can actually push out um, working software to their as, a, as actual releases to the to the public a few times a day. Uh, that's too far for a lot of mainstream organizations today, but certainly two weeks is definitely feasible. So if that's what, uh, you know, and, and the reason, by the way, why I mentioned that's the most important, because if you are pushing software out frequently, that's what enables all the other practices out there uh, in, in uh, Agile. So we can get away with minimal upfront planning if we're getting feedback every couple of weeks, because that way we're not going to get too far, we're, we're not going to go too far off course. Um, we're only going to go about two weeks off course at a time. Uh, we can get away with just-in-time analysis. Uh, because we know that every couple of weeks we're going to be doing some work and we can delay the analysis for that work until until such time as we're going to need it. And we can get away with well, writing a lot of requirements down uh, because the time, the time lag between finding out what the requirements are and actually implementing those requirements is also short if we're working on something like two-week iterations, two-week sprints. That's a, that's a cycle in which something usable actually gets created. So that's that's what I mean by Agile. And now what do I mean by Agile business analysis in that case? Uh, some people argue there's no such thing. Uh, agile business analysis is just good business analysis. Uh, I'd say that's true, but it kind of begs the question. The question really is, is Agile, is business analysis as practiced in an Agile context, does it look the same as business analysis as practiced in a waterfall context? And the answer to that is no. 
uh, their same principles apply, um, you know, you're after the same thing, but the way that they're implemented is actually quite different. Anyway, that's my uh, informal definition. If you want a really formal definition that binds together, you know, agile plus business analysis, uh, then here's one for you. Uh, and my thanks to the Babok for giving me some of the, some of the verbiage that I've got in here on the uh, business analysis side. So agile business analysis is a practice for enabling and responding to change in an organization by examining risk stakeholder needs and recommending solutions. So far, so good, because that's true for all business analysis. Here is where things get a little different. In a context of evolving and rapidly changing requirements and business needs, it's the context uh, which makes agile business analysis different from business analysis and waterfall. And that's a context where those needs are analyzed and realized through an iterative incremental process that pushes working product enhancements out to users in short intervals. Those, you know, continually improving versions of the product are called the increments, and the uh, short intervals themselves are called iterations. So if you've heard of that term, iterative incremental development, it's referring to those two aspects. So agile business analysis is just doing business analysis in that environment. Now, I don't know if any of you are raising your eyebrows at this point, but some of you are thinking, man, that's just, that's the whole thing's just a big oxymoron. Uh, and in fact, that's the kind of thinking that led, um, you know, these consultants in the early days to say these two things actually, they don't, they don't go together and they shouldn't go together. Now, part of the reason is, you know, the, is that we're bringing together two movements that came into being around the same time, around the 1990s, but they went along parallel paths and almost like never the twain shall meet. We found Agile uh, mostly in smaller startup type companies and we found BAs in large mainstream companies. And because these two contexts were different, we never really had to look at, you know, is there an inherent contradiction between them? But now that's changing. Uh, and now mainstream companies are, have moved over uh, to Agile today. And in that case, and those are the very same companies that have business, business analysis. Now, business analysis up until this point had been largely associated with huge amounts of documentation and huge amounts of upfront planning. Uh, and the BA was this person who talked to the business and then went ahead and talked to the developers. So they're a messenger moving back and forth. All of this is very antithetical to the way Agile wants to operate. And, and because business analysis had this association in the past of, of working that way uh, and looking that way, um, there was this, what I feel, a misconception that business analysis couldn't work, therefore, in an Agile environment. But of course, none of that's true. Business analysis was always about doing the right amounts of upfront planning and the right amount of documentation for the situation. It's just that beforehand, the situation was waterfall. <laughs> Nowadays, the situation in the, that BAs in mainstream companies find themselves in is not, uh, is not that way. In fact, uh, we're now, they're now increasingly finding themselves in an agile context. So the context changes, the way you apply the approach, of the, the, the business analysis practice itself is gonna change as well. So I wanted to give you a bit of a feeling, hard, hard and fast feeling of what, they, what I'm talking about when I say agile business analysis in terms of the characteristics. And I think this will be helpful for you as well if you're a, um, if any of you out there are decision makers for your companies, these are the ways you're gonna, you, you can expect things to change for your BAs. And if you yourself are a BA going through this change, this is what you can expect. First of all, uh, we can say for 100% that agile business analysis is now widely accepted as a competency, but I can't say that's necess always the case uh, with respect to it as a role. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that there is a recognition, uh, even in Scrum, by the way, which is most often quoted as being antithetical to business analysis, a close view of the Scrum Guide will show that in fact, there's a recognition that it's a, that it's a required competency. I think we have a slide later on where I can show you the quote. Uh, however, uh, what we can't say for sure though is that it's a role. Um, and that's simply because uh, approaches like Scrum uh, have a hard and fast rule. And that is that everybody on the team is called a generic term like developer. And there are no sub teams within the team. Uh, the reason for that is to foster the idea of a, uh, foster the feeling of a shared team responsibility for all competencies. But it doesn't mean that there aren't specialists within those teams that actually are particularly good at particular things. So I don't think anybody would argue that we don't need a QA person anymore. We do, 
In the same way, we also need a BA on Agile teams. But it may or may not be a role, and I'll talk a little bit later about what the role, formal role might or might not look like. Uh, Agile teams are very, very good at responding to you know, user requirements. The user doesn't like this, we'll make a change, we can respond very, very quickly. Uh, where there is trouble uh, sometimes with teams is getting is the, is the big picture. How do you get from business need all the way to solutions? I'm going to return to this question again. But it, there isn't really, I, I guess, there's not often anybody really trained at being able to do that, to be able to really understand this whole value stream that takes you from business need to detailed uh, IT requirements, especially in Agile where the rush is to actually get right in there, roll up your sleeves and start doing some work. So it's the Agile VA that actually provides that expertise. We're looking at a practice also which has just barely enough documentation. Documentation doesn't just disappear in Agile. We still require, we still need requirements documentation and there still is, there still are artifacts. You could argue about whether we should call it requirements documentation or something else, but to me that's, that's an argument, that's a linguistic argument. Uh, documentation does exist, but we try to minimize it. The same thing is also true for planning. Uh, even um, extreme approaches like extreme programming uh, acknowledge the, the necessity of planning at different horizons. Um, however, we're going to use uh, as Agile BAs um, low ceremony uh, approaches to doing that. Now, another aspect uh, of what work is going to be like for you as a BA if you are working BAs versus how, how it would have been for you in Waterfall is the timing of the analysis. Many, much of the analysis that you're going to be doing is actually going to be the same, but it's going to be timed differently. Instead of being all up front the way that we did with Waterfall, uh, you're going to find that the analysis is just in time. Uh, you may find, for example, that you're analyzing uh, requirements just before you need them, uh, or in some cases it's um, uh, even in the very uh, um, iteration in which those requirements are going to be implemented right at the start of that, you'll be picking up some of the detailed requirements. General rule is we'll leave it as late as possible uh, without paying a penalty. Um, we often divide requirements up into smaller units, about one or two sprints, that's iterations before the implementation time. If there's complicated analysis, we might do that also, um, at least one sprint beforehand. And anything else that can be done during the same sprint will be done during the implementation sprint. Another uh, difference you'll find is the emphasis on conversation and examples to capture the requirements. Um, because we are going to be implementing very close to the analysis time, uh, it means that we can rely on conversation. We rely also on examples to drive out, we, uh, drive out the requirements. So we might say, what happens in this situation and in this situation? If you're using user stories and you've got acceptance criteria as part of your user stories, if this stuff may, if this is familiar to you, those acceptance criteria, these are the examples that I'm talking about. Another difference uh, that you'll see um, in uh, applying business analysis to Agile is that the requirements, there, there's a new restriction now on the requirements units. They have to be small. The general ruling is uh, each requirements unit should be doable, implementable, um, within comfortably within an iteration. Since most iter iterations are about two weeks, we're talking about roughly about a five-day uh, period for that requirement to be analyzed. Uh, that's not that wasn't a concern in Waterfall because all the analysis had to be done up front, so we didn't have to chop it up into little pieces so you could do a little bit at a time, uh, and so that you can implement them a little bit at a time. It is an issue, an issue though for Agile. Uh, we're also looking at lightweight requirements management processes. So uh, we may or may not use tools, and we and we use those tools in such a way that they're lightweight. So some of the planning tools like the product roadmap, the product canvas, the story map that are used uh, within Agile are, you know, actually fairly lightweight, uh, succinct, uh, non-heavy writing <laughs> uh, forms of uh, requirements management. A huge change uh, is also the way the requirements are actually used. Um, in a waterfall environment, those uh, requirements are baselined and then they are, and they are frozen. And any change, uh, changes may come after that, but they must follow a you know, very formal change process. And in Agile, those requirements are not frozen and they can actually be changed at any time. The type of relationship that business analysis is uh, also aiming to support 
um, is a very different um, uh, type of relationship that you find in a waterfall approach. The, the, the relationship is collaborative, uh, meaning that there's a constant uh, negotiation back and forth between the business and, and, the, IT, and the IT side, the solution provider, uh, to figure out what's the best way to do something, as opposed to getting something set in stone that this is the plan of what we're going to do and when we're going to do it and we're not going to change it. Uh, and, if, and, if, and if you do, there are contractual penalties for doing so. Uh, it's exactly the opposite in, in uh, Agile business analysis. We welcome those changes without much ceremony at all. Uh, and then the actual tools that you're going to be using as a BA are going to be different as well. When that senior VP or senior executive asks me, you know, and if we do use Agile BAs, are they doing the same thing? Well, let me say that the toolbox is actually a mix. We continue to use process models uh, in the same situations where they used to be appropriate and they're still going to be appropriate and things like uh, business rules uh, uh, um, flows and uh, and but on top of all of those things, we're also doing, um, we're also using techniques, and you shouldn't need to be familiar technique with techniques that are very, and even with ideas and terminology that's specific to agile, uh, and specific to business analysis in an agile environment. So things like user stories, story maps, personas, roadmaps, the definition of done, all of this comes out of is part of this agile analysis toolbox. Uh, the timing of your own analysis is going to be different and so uh, than it was in Waterfall, and so is the timing of stakeholder involvement. Both of these issues were heavy, heavy in, in Waterfall, are very, very heavy at the beginning and at the end of the life cycle. Um, both the analysts and the stakeholders who are being interviewed are involved a lot at the beginning in order to find out what the requirements are, and, very, and they're also involved at the end point uh, to make sure those requirements are satisfied, and there isn't a lot of involvement in the middle. Um, the whole way that this is managed in Agile is quite different because we need both parties, both the, the you, the business analyst, and your stakeholders are involved throughout that whole process. And finally, uh, if any of you are thinking, of, are thinking of training, you know, towards becoming an Agile BA, you've got to become familiar with a lot of the guidances that impact on the practice of business analysis in that context. So I'm talking about XP. I'm talking about reading up on Scrum, on Kanban, on SAFE, which is the Scaled Agile Framework by Dean Leffingwell, uh, Lean Software Development, which gives us the idea of, you know, not having waste and minimizing waste, Lean Startup, which brings us MVP, and then there are writers out there who have really added a lot uh, without adding in a full formal methodology, but they've added on very important guidance and techniques. That includes people like Richard Lawrence, Jeff Patton, and Mike Cohen. Now, that's as far as the, that's what, Agile business analysis looks like. Uh, what about the actual role? Um, slide here, if you're seeing it, and I sure hope you are right now, um, is um, the DSDM snowman. So hopefully that's what you're seeing in front of you. It's slide number 14. And uh, DSDM uh, is, called, is the dynamic system development method. It's a, I guess, European-based approach. Uh, the life cycle itself is referred to sometimes as a turn. And uh, what, uh, if you look at the snowman, you'll you see all the roles that are in that approach. And look at that right there, smack in the middle between the top and the bottom is the business analyst, uh, facilitating communication between the business side and the solution provider side. Now, I presented that slide at a, uh, at a conference at the Norway Developers Conference, and some smart person came up to me and said, gee, you know, Podesta, I was wondering why you showed that particular slide, because, uh, you know, we don't use DSDM very much over here. Uh, well, my, I had to sheepishly answer that uh, the reason I showed that slide is because it's actually one of the few agile methodologies out there, or frameworks out there, that, that explicitly mentions the BA as a rule. Uh, so I had to push a little bit to the edges there, to the extremes to find something. Uh, the real question for us, though, for most organizations is, you know, what about, you know, more common approaches like Scrum? Now, Scrum does not equal Agile. Remember, Agile is a general philosophy, and there are many ways to apply that philosophy. Scrum is one of those ways. Scrum actually predates, predates Agile. But since it is probably the most commonly used one out there, especially for, for mainstream organizations, people like governments, insurance companies, banks, and so on, I'm going to talk about that right now. Let me just right up front say there is nobody called the business analyst in Scrum, and that's the kind of thing that got people a little bit worried. But that does not mean there is not business analysis 
or people who might be doing business analysis in Scrum, whether or not they have that name. Uh, this is slide 15. I hope you're seeing that. Um, and I've got sort of like a where's Waldo. Uh, everywhere you see that Waldo, there is a BA, there is BA activity going on. There's a little dashed line around that person. That means they're BA-ish. It means that their role encompasses a lot of other things, but within that, are there's a lot of overlap with what BAs do. And so BAs may find themselves, pe people who have been previously trained as BAs may find themselves in those roles. Let me give you an example. The Scrum team talks about the developer. And as I mentioned earlier, that's the only person that's actually allowed, you know, to have a name within Scrum. That person is expected to be multifunctional. In other words, they could take on any job that, you know, they could be given. That's formally speaking. Uh, in actual fact, the Scrum approach does recognize that there are people out there that have specialties. You know, they're particularly good at something. Their main concern, as I mentioned earlier, is that it, that they not become bottlenecks, the only people who can do those jobs. Uh, Scrum wants to keep the responsibility for getting it all done right to be a team responsibility, and that's why it breaks, doesn't want to break out these names. But in actual fact, there it's very common to find somebody, oops, I'm sorry, I don't know how that happened. It is very common to find somebody uh, on the team who is, in fact, doing the job of the IT, what we would used to call, let's say, the ITBA. And in, in fact, in some organizations, they break scrum rules and actually call the person that. They're the team BA. So whether they're called it or not, you're very common to find one of those people on a team. I've also found some companies, they go even beyond that. Not only do they have one BA on the team, they've got two BAs. Now, that second BA may be a shared BA, and that's the business BA. So they sometimes break it up so that what you, in your organizations today, call a business BA who focuses on business objectives, those more high-level uh, types of aspects of, the, of, uh, of business needs. Um, that person, uh, they need that person on the team, and they also need the person who does the detailed IT requirements today. That person with, who was doing that on Waterfall is now doing that um, on the Scrum team. So one or two people, more commonly one, but sometimes even two, that are BAs within the team itself. Now that team, of about five to seven people, are referred to as the development team in Scrum. The larger team, which includes a couple of other uh, roles, is called the Scrum team. What about there? Well, the typical person who sort of runs the whole show and represents the customer is the product owner in Scrum. That product owner is typically somebody who comes from the business side, understands the business really well, but their job uh, includes a huge amount uh, of responsibility that is classic business analysis responsibility. It's managing the requirements using different words, but it's actually what it means. The product owner also has a responsibility to prioritize those requirements, which is not classic BA responsibility. And that's why I have it as BA-ish. So what we find there is that either the product owner, uh, who is a person coming over from business, gets extra training so that they can do the BA aspects of their role. And we do a lot of that kind of work. A lot of people who come for training to us are in fact in that position. They've previously been product managers or business subject matter experts. Uh, or the product owner gets help from the team's BA, that person over right over on the uh, right-hand side that I show there within that development team box. Another option that's sometimes done is to have a proxy PO, and I have that person showing as a Waldo without the dashed line. So that person is actually a real BA. In fact, some of you who are BAs today in Waterfall might find yourselves as proxy POs once you move yourselves over into Agile. What's this proxy PO? A proxy product owner is like a product owner except for the final decision making or maybe aspects of the final decision making. That basically makes them a pure BA, in fact, which is what they are. That proxy owner, when they have to make decisions, then goes to somebody higher up who might be the product manager uh, who makes the final decisions for them. Uh, so in a sense, it's not ideal um, in terms of Agile. Some people like it, some do not, uh, but it's a common approach to solving a problem uh, and uh, it's approach that involves the BA, because the BA often fills that role. Who else? Well, outside of that team, it all are some free floaters, people who might move from team to team, um, you know, as the organization decides to slot them in there. Uh, you've got um, just a gen people who always have been facilitators. Well, it's great if those facilitators know how to facilitate in a requirement solicit, you know, in the context of requirement solicitation. In other words, if they're also BAs. And we've also got people who, you know, are, are either pulled in from the outside as third-party coaches to help scrum teams. And those coaches um, also often have BA training or they often maybe were BAs and became coaches. So if you're a BA today, 
Yeah, you might think of combining what you have today with becoming a coach um, in uh, Scrum or in Agile, uh, with becoming a combination of BA plus Scrum Master, a combination of your BA knowledge plus, you know, whatever it needs to bring yourselves up to a proxy PO. So that's kind of where we find you um, in terms of the role. I won't spend too long on these slides, but I just basically there to prove to you that, look at what it, uh, in the, uh, the quote here, domains that need to be addressed like business analysis. Team members may have specialized skills and areas of focus. So that's if anybody tells you that somebody who is really good at business analysis, you know, and that's their specialty, and they, if you, someone wants to say they don't belong on an agile team, show them this slide, because yes, they do. This slide shows you exactly what uh, BA responsibilities uh, are included within the product owner's role. That's what I was talking about earlier, and it all has to do with managing what's in what's called in Scrum the product backlog. But items in the product backlog are the requirements. So in fact, all of these uh, bolded items here on this slide represent uh, requirements management issues um, and communication issues that VAs have always been responsible for, and they actually are a part of the product owner's job. In terms of the Scrum Master, uh, we can you know, look at uh, that, per that role's um, responsibilities as well. And again, there's great overlap. Um, Finding techniques for effective product, product backlog management. That's, in other words, what's the right technique to manage the requirements? That's a senior BA job and always has been. It's just that now it's here being expressed um, uh, in you know, scrum terms. Uh, helping the scrum team understand the need for clear and concise product backlog items. Again, that's the type of thing that if we just replace the word requirements for product backlog items, that's classic BA stuff. So with all of that, uh, uh, what's the, uh, you know, what does the data actually show us? In other words, the idea of combining, ad, you know, adding business analysis to Agile or combining these two ideas was that we would get the benefits of both sides, that we would make Agile better. Uh, does the, you know, do the facts actually, you know, bear that out? Uh, and so uh, what I have to say is, uh, yes, it does. <laughs> now, it's not just me saying it. Um, we'll look at some studies. Um, I could bring you a lot of them here, but I just highlighted a couple. Uh, this one is from the IAG Business Analysis Benchmark done in 2008 uh, by Keith Ellis. Um, just, I guess, disclosure, uh, a friend of mine, uh, and a colleague, but we did meet really professionally originally. This was done by him, and um, what, he's, what they found out, and it was a very extensive study, uh, was that regardless of methodology, regardless of methodology, if you don't have a mature requirements practice, uh, you will pay a price. And the price is about 60%. In other words, teams that don't have uh, a mature requirements uh, methodology are paying about 60% more in terms of time and in terms of cost than teams that do. And this applies to Agile as well. So that's the that 60% improvement is an improvement that Agile teams will see and have seen. What else uh, have they found out? Uh, they took it. They looked at it another way. What if we look at project success rates and then plot them against the methodology being used, uh, and then against the requirements discovery and management maturity level? In other words, the degree to which the requirements process is mature. And once again, you can see here that with every, whatever methodology you start with and whatever its initial you know level of success, if you add in the mature requirements process, it gets much much better. In terms of Agile, what does this mean? How much better? We're talking about over twice, we're, we're getting a, an over two times, over 200% improvement. The actual figures here, if you're curious, is it goes from 41.67% to 91.4% as, as in terms of success rates as companies go from low requirements processes to more mature requirements processes. Now, what those uh, figures don't uh, actually call out uh, and they don't break out, is exactly why this is so. And so um, these are the top 10 reasons why I found that it's so. Uh, in other words, as I've been going around from organization to organization, here's what we found out. Typically, and let, you know, let, let us know uh, if this is true for you as well, I'm curious. Most organizations start off with what I would call a very thin, agile business analysis practice. And I, you could barely call it that, but they hardly even recognize it as such. What are they doing? They're using user stories. They are uh, using a one-dimensional stack, which means that basically, you know, the the most the the item at the top of the stack that's most important is the one they're going to do first, and they will 
slot in as many of these requirements items, they're called user stories, but I just want to, I'm using the generic term because I don't know who I have out there. So these requirements items, uh, they've slotted as many as they can uh, for the time they have available in that two week period if they're running on two week sprints. And that's it. That's basically what they're doing in terms of requirements management, in terms of you know requirements techniques, a very, very thin, simple approach. You can excuse people for doing that because if you read Scrum, you won't find anything more, the Scrum guide doesn't have anything much more elaborate than that. And all the planning that's in Scrum is actually for the two weeks and there isn't any great technique for trying to figure out what would happen in the two weeks following that and the, one, the ones following that. Uh, so, you know, I'd almost call that the naive approach. The thing is though, that that approach really does work if what you're dealing with are simple situations. Um, what's happened with these organizations is that as they've matured, they've run into trouble. And what I'm going to bring up now are these sort of 10 sort of scenarios um, that have led them to believe that they've got to keep their BAs and they just have to adapt them for Agile, um, but they do need a BA practice of some kind within, and a mature one within their Agile process. So here we go with, you know, number one. And a quick uh, question to Carl, do we have a hard stop at 145? Um, yeah, we, well, not a hard, hard stop, but... Uh... I might take it to 150 if I can. I'm not sure. There you go. Just to <laughs> just to allow a little bit of time for uh, for some questions. Okay. So let's have a look at the first one here. The first reason why people find they need it is that complex business problems require mature BA tools, and going agile isn't going to change that. The problems that we encounter uh, on projects have not changed, and they didn't disappear just because we went agile. The reason that techniques were invented to understand complex business rules using things like decision tables and decision trees and so on is because it's business rules tend to be complicated. And so we need, you know, we've been bumping up against the problem. We needed tools to help us get around interviews like that and tools to help us document what we're expecting from the software in situations like that. The same is true uh, once an agile team starts to take on transformational change and wants to change the whole way a business process is handling, is being handled. We're not talking about, you know, a simple user requirement being changed here and there. We're talking about, you know, the entire process. For example, if a company is merging with another company, which has happened with some of the clients that we're dealing with, say two banks that are merging. So all of that process modeling that you used to do, you still have to do. It's going to be timed a little bit differently. You may not do all of it up front. You may do a little bit as you go, but you still need to do it. And we're going to basically use very similar tools, if not exactly the same tools that we used to do when we run into those situations. Next, you know, I think I, I wanted to make the point that analysis, you know, is at least as hard in Agile as it is in Waterfall whenever the business problem itself is hard. But what some people don't realize is not only that, but it actually is harder. What do I mean by it's harder? Well, because Agile is iterative incremental, this introduces new difficulties that business analysts didn't have to deal with prior to all of this. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Well, iterative means that we are going to do a little bit and then we're going to go back and do a little bit more and go back and do a little bit more. And each of these little bits is an entire little mini cycle of analysis, design, uh, you know, coding, testing, and putting it out there into the hands of users. Uh, well, you know, that takes, uh, because we're now not doing all the analysis up front as we were in Waterfall, but doing a little bit of analysis in each one of those mini cycles, we now have to plan when we're going to do which little bit. This adds a whole level of complication that didn't exist in Waterfall. Those who have been involved in that actually have to now be trained with this extra ability to plan that activity. Another thing that doesn't happen at all in Waterfall, which makes Agile more complicated, is the whole issue of splitting. Splitting means that I start with a, you know, I, I may have a big requirement, but if that chunk of requirements isn't actually codable, I mean actually a whole thing of, analyzing, coding, testing, all that stuff. You can't do that in two weeks. Um, it, it, you have to actually, you have to chop that requirement up into a smaller piece. But not only that, you have to chop it up into a smaller piece that will still provide value to the user. Um, it's difficult to make something small and to make it valuable at the same time. If you're running into a system in your own Agile organizations where um, you're having trouble doing this split or you're splitting them, but the requirements are so big, still pretty big, that they all kind of end near the end of the iteration. That's a problem too, because 
QA now gets overloaded at the very, very end. And if anything goes wrong, you've got no elbow room. So the splitting is an important issue, um, but it, it's something that you didn't have to worry about pre-agile. And finally, you know, the requirements themselves and their priorities are changing all the time. And how do you manage all of this and manage all the dependencies within this when this is everything is shifting under your feet all the time? It makes it more difficult. Now, here's another situation that uh, many companies are running into, and the answer very often is agile business analysis. And, you know, think about this for yourselves if this is happening in your own business. Lack of resources on the business side. What I mean here is that agile requires not less but more stakeholder involvement you know i'm reminded now of a, a conversation i had with one of our consultants who we send out to a client and i asked how things are going and he said it's going great They're, the uptake on agile is fantastic by the business community and i'm saying okay that's that's good to hear why and i find out the why is because they believe that agile is going to mean less work for them in fact it's totally not true the stakeholders, as we talked about earlier, are involved throughout the process and they're involved more throughout that process. In other words, we want them on hand every day. Uh, and we need more of them because we need some representative from the business to be on every team of about seven people. And that's a lot more than we we're often allocating beforehand. So we need those people and we need them involved with that team every single day. There are many, many answers to how to solve this problem. We can have a proxy PO. But that means we need a BA in that position. We can have a product owner who we actually share amongst teams. Not ideal, but it's doable if there is a BA on the team to help them get through the requirements. Um, so these are, you know, one, uh, a number of many solutions out there. All the solutions, we have rotating POs. There are, there's uh, companies will take in a, a, a business uh, side subject matter expert, throw them on an agile team, but only for a temporary period and then take them off. Uh, that's so they can stay fresh. Trouble though is, as you keep moving people in and out, who has the continuity about the requirements? Again, it's the Agile BA. So Agile BA can be a very, very important part of your solution and has been uh, for solving that resource problem. Number four is that Agile assumes that all relationships are collaborative. Kumbaya, it's not actually always that way. So we deal, for example, with a company in India that does development uh, software development for companies in the United States primarily. Uh, the, the level of trust that, you know, should be there for a collaborative agile relationship is not. When it's not there and the relationship is by its nature contractual, you're going to need more written requirements because that's basically a way to protect the customer to say, if the development, you know, if the, the software development company does not develop this, 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 and this, and this, and this, they don't get paid. Many companies are, are fine when they're dealing with small initiatives, but as soon as those initiatives get big and they've got multiple teams, they need a more mature process to handle that. How do you deal with the dependencies between teams when everyone just has a bunch of cards that they're looking at? I can't actually see in that case what the other team is doing and I can't track the dependencies. So we start using all sorts of techniques that are more sophisticated than the, the, the bare bones, you know, BA toolkit that Scrum comes with. Uh, things like feature previews, which come out of the world of SAFE, uh, that scaled agile framework for, again. Uh, big, rooms plan, uh, big, big room sprint planning meetings, the scrum of scrums, um, the ability to save requirements to a traditional format because some of those teams might not even be agile, and so you have to be able to talk to them. BAs bring all of these techniques uh, to the team and to the, to the organization. Point number six is for some reasons is for some organizations is the reason why they're going with agile business analysis. And it's quite simply that uh, they're, they're finding that they just would not, I've actually heard, heard this from senior executives. I would never put my developers in front of, I can't put them in front of the business side. Uh, it's not nice to say, we may not like to say it, but you know, I had been a developer. One of the first things I was told when I was a developer was don't say a word, just keep your mouth shut until I tell you to say something. There were that I might say something that might, for example, obligate them uh, and it'll be hard to, to back away from that. And you know, we don't always trust developers to say the right thing. And on the other hand, BAs are people who have those good communication skills uh, that we would trust. And so many organizations just don't wanna lose those people from the team for that reason alone. 
Uh, you may be working in an organization now that has a work from anywhere policies, which means that the people, that, you know, the expectation of Agile that all those people are going to be sitting in the room at the same time is just actually increasingly just not true today. And when that's not true, we have to write a lot of requirements down uh, and we need a common repository so that everybody can dip into that. Uh, Another reason that uh, maybe it's a larger reason why uh, companies find they have to uh, get more sophisticated in agile business analysis is because they find they're good at the small stuff, but not so great at the big stuff. So the, by the small stuff, I mean they're getting the user requirements, you know, quite down quite well, and they're really matching them in the software. At the same time, they might be missing the big objective, which might be, you know, our whole reason for doing something might have been to reduce churn, reduce customer churn, so we have less customers dropping off each year. Even though we have a great product out there that users love, maybe it's not actually moving the needle. Agile business analysis provides us uh, an entire process that takes us from the business objectives to the detailed IT requirements without breaking that chain. It's something that many Agile teams really need, especially with that focus to, you know, jump right to code. Number nine, we often need to do better than just planning two weeks ahead. Uh, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, the, the out-of-the-box scrum approach will give you, you know, two-week-ahead planning. That's lovely. Uh, you know, what about managing stakeholders' expectations who might actually find that in iterative development, things can actually get a little bit worse before they get better? We've got to be able to tell them uh, when that's going to happen. Uh, it was a big issue uh, for one of the companies that we dealt with. It just that put in a, a geographical information system. Uh, they're buying the system from a third party, and until they were, until they got to the iterations where they were going to make customized changes to that, things were actually going to get a little bit worse. Uh, for governance reasons, people need a lot more paper uh, for, in order to coordinate with waterfall teams. Uh, water, those waterfall teams aren't working on two weeks necessarily; they're probably working more on like two to three months. So we we need to know where we're going to be uh, at that point. Even when some of the teams are not, even when all the teams are agile. Um, there are synchronization points where we want to have all the teams on the same page and synchronize and, and improvements integrated. Uh, that's, those are that higher level cycles called the program increment in SAFE. Um, and it's more than two weeks. It's a number of sprints. Uh, and so we bring a lot of techniques. The ones on the right are sort of techniques that Agile BAs bring to bear, like story mapping, product canvases, and roadmaps, and so on, to do that longer range planning. And then finally, uh, from a strategic level, uh, agile business analysis is extremely important uh, part of the solution. Often we find we're building the product right, we're doing everything right, but it may not be the right product for our particular market. How do we know that we're actually spending our money in a way that's going to move the needle in the most important way for us? So there are techniques uh, that do do this, but without uh, business analysts there to embed those techniques in the requirements process, you may, you, uh, we find that many organizations are not doing them properly. So you may have heard of Lean Startup Minimum Viable Product. The whole idea behind that is to run experiments to test your assumptions in the marketplace, experiments that don't cost you very much money, but very, very minimal development to see if you're on the right track, and then using actionable metrics. These are metrics that really, really tell you whether or not your investment is going in the right direction to make the decision about whether we're going to double down on the investment now or whether we're going to back up. I can give you lots of examples of that. A very simple one would be um, a uh, uh, company financial services that has been realizing that um, people are, their customers are applying for their products but not going all the way through. And it turns out they were using the application process to benefit from a free assessment. They started to think, oh, what if we actually offer this assessment service? Uh, Lean Startup would find a way to, for them to offer that service without doing a lot of programming, and but make it look to the customer like they're getting the full thing. And if things look good, then they put in all the money that really is required to make it really happen for real. And finally, my last slide is that for many of us who are working in mainstream organizations, where pretty well everything that I talked about applies. Uh, all of the reasons, in other words, for a mature business analysis practice applies. They're not small initiatives, they're large. Their teams are not you know, they're not um, uh, uh, independent. Um, uh, they're very in interdependent. In other words, there are a lot of dependencies between those teams. Uh, informal communication is not going to be enough for them. There is not an element of trust. There is a contractual relationship. Um, you know, uh, we can't uh, make do with a short planning horizon because of governance and other reasons. The organization requires more. 
Uh, there isn't frequent face-to-face -face contact. Teams are dispersed across the country and sometimes across continents. And so for all those reasons, and for all the reasons that I talked about, um, these are all reasons pointing to uh, those companies towards developing a mature agile business analysis process. And that's what we've been spending the last few years uh, helping organizations do. So that's my argument. Um, I hope I've convinced you. And um, I guess we'll take it over to Carl. Great. Thank you very much, Howard. Um, so, yeah, so this is, uh, we have a couple minutes left. Now is your opportunity. If you have a question, to please input that. And I do actually have two that have come in, uh, Howard, so yes. you can uh, give us a quick and easy answer on this. I apologize, some are going back a bit in the presentation, but uh, Olivier asked about how do we control our baseline? So I'm wondering if you can sum that up in, uh, briefly, how to control the baseline. What do you mean by the baseline? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what I, what I, if we're talking about baseline requirements, the answer is there are no baseline requirements. So, uh, in other words, requirements are not frozen. Um, it's a whole way, a whole different way to get yourself, thing to get yourself used to for organizations, which is that there's almost no such thing as a commitment. In Scrum, the only commitment actually is at the beginning of a two-week period, we commit to the Scrum goal, which is like the overall thing we're trying to achieve in the next two weeks. Uh, and that's it. We're not even committing to the user stories, which are the specific requirements that have been slotted into that two weeks. We may not even be able to get them done, and there's no penalty if you didn't get them done. Uh, so how do we do any kind of control at all? Uh, well, we do some uh, non-committal planning. Um, a roadmap will look at the next few years. A uh, story map will look at the next few months, up to the next, let's say, three or four months, and do some planning. Uh, and then the planning for that actual sprint looks at the next two weeks. It's just that then the first thing is that those things are not set in stone and we allow changes and invite changes to happen at any time. The second thing is that we don't allow, you know, you can, they, they, the customer can do whatever they want. They can drop requirements. They can add, they can, even in the middle of a two-week sprint, they can drop a new requirement in there. As long as, and this is the way we control it, uh, as long as uh, the budget is not blown. So if I have X number of hours of developer time available to me, and remember by developer, I mean anybody working on the initiative, uh, and this extra request means that I'm 10 hours short now, you know, I'm, I'm going over my budget, then I have to drop 10 hours out of there and move it to another sprint. And that's the way we control that. And of course, the other thing that we do is we always ask ourselves, is what we're about to do going to endanger any of our goals? Is it going to endanger the sprint goal, for example, that's coming up in the sprint? And if it is, we don't allow for it. And okay. finally, we have there are all sorts of techniques within Scrum to just gauge our, pros, our, our progress and see whether or not, you know, it actually looks reasonable that we're going to hit the mark. Uh, things like burn down charts and so on help us gauge things on a daily basis. Okay. A couple more, so if we can maybe squeeze these in. Yes. Uh, Rich was asking, can a BA be successful on the Agile team if they work off-site from the rest of the Scrum team? Uh -huh. That's a good question. If we're talking about the person doing like the IT BA, which I think we're, we're talking about there, the answer is it's highly unrecommended. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we have, uh, this, I mentioned a company that we deal with in India. Uh, they are confronted with this situation. What they've done is they've sent their BAs to the United States, so the United States, so that they can work. Actually, let me put this another way. That that in that case, their BA was very close to the business. Um, I'm, con I'm contradicting myself right now. As long as their BA is close to the business, it is possible to make it work. Um, if the developers are off-site, and I've seen it work, but it's not ideal. It's uh, the more ideal thing is to have everybody there at the same okay. time. Same and, and one last one, if we can squeeze this one in too. Uh, any tricks in managing dependencies in an agile manner? Uh, yes, there's a lot of tricks on that, and that's kind of what that, uh, that slide that I showed up a little bit earlier uh, had, uh, was about. Uh, so one of them is um, the feature preview. Uh, by the way, first of all, let me just say that the old tricks still work. So if you, for example, have been keeping traceability matrices uh, in the past as a BA, where you track, you know, uh, you look at what's the dependency between this, requir this requirement and yet another requirement, and it could be the requirement that another team is doing, those matrices can keep track of all of those things for you. And we have tools to make that a little bit easier. In terms of more lightweight, you know, tricks that help, uh, one of them is shared team members. I think that's the most lightweight, simple answer 
you have a team member who, let's say you've got a lot of dependencies between a front-end team that's developing an interface and a back-end team that's going to, you know, receive those transactions and pass it off to a back to the to a back-end system. Uh, and there's a lot of dependencies because the whole thing won't work if both sides aren't happening. So what we have is we have a team member who uh, who sits on both, as both of those teams are doing their planning, both daily and as they're doing their sprint planning, we just have shared team members who see both. That's how we do it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Lots more, by the way, Carl, but that's... Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you very much for that, Howard. I think we've uh, run out of time for questions. If there are any more, uh, certainly you can uh, email those to us and we can try to follow up that way. That's One uh, thing I will mention, we'll be emailing out a link to a recording of this presentation. And also, if you can see my slide, we are uh, offering a promotion to you all. We have a course coming up in a few weeks' time, a two-day session entitled Business Analysis in an Agile World. This was a course that was developed by Howard, and uh, we're offering 25% off to all of you if you want to uh, enroll on that session. You can see the link. How do you uh, find that course on our website, as well as the uh, coupon code that you can use to benefit from that 25% discount. And that will be offered live in class at our Ottawa Centre. But if you're not in Ottawa, you can also attend virtually uh, through Train Live. So I wanted to share that off with you. So again, thank you everybody for that. A couple other notes. Uh, our next webinar that could be of interest to you, it's entitled Organizational Agility, coming up on February 28th. And I'll also mention, because Howard's much too modest, his uh, next book that's coming up, A Practitioner's Guide to Agile Business Analysis. So keep your eyes open. That's coming out around the end of 2017. That'll so be again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Howard, for an excellent oh, presentation. It's been a pleasure. And we hope to see you all very soon on an upcoming course or webinar. Bye for now. Bye-bye.